Welcome back to The Fix with me, Karima Brown. Calling out his party, ANC stalwart Ben Turok says new ways to resolve the contradictions facing the ANC are needed. In a searing article appearing in Business Day on Thursday, he said the ANC either adapts or it will die. He now joins me via Skype. Professor Turok, a very good morning and welcome to The Fix. Thank you for coming through. Good morning. Now, you didn't mince your words. You were effectively saying we face two major crises, the crisis of the economy and the moral crisis in the public life. Unfortunately, the latter has captured public attention at the very time all should be, due, uh, be done to be fixing the economy. But the two are intertwined. The ANC can only fix the economy if it's re-elected. If people feel that it has failed morally, that its DNA is completely tainted by corruption, uh, it won't be able uh, to put forward policies. What do you think, uh, Professor Turok, of the latest developments involving Cyril Ramaphosa and his ability to clean up the organization and to have that economic discussion to look at the concerns of the majority? Well, what shocks me is this morning the Sunday Times published the story about this money that was given to Cyril's campaign. And what shocks me is the Americanization of Ramaphosa's campaign. 200 people contributed to his campaign fund. Now this was an ordinary election for the president of the ANC. Why was it run like a Trump campaign? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that bothers me. Yes. The ANC is having a national conference and they're going to elect a national executive and a new president and so on. This is not the same thing as the Americanization of the presidency of, of the United States. Why, and of, of course, why Professor they have this? Yes. Um, of course, it's not only Cyril Ramaphosa who used money. We know that all the candidates used money. And this goes to the heart of the problem that you raise, that there is, in fact, a problem with the functioning of the African National Congress. And capture can only happen if we are untransparent about who funds political parties. We know there's a current bill before Parliament, and parties are meant to be um, you know, disclosing who is funding them. We know, for example, the EFF is refusing to do this. But this um, obviously elevates the need for us to have a transparent understanding of who funds political parties and also how the African National Congress deals with succession. Well, absolutely. And it seems to me this, this issue of the donation to Ramaphosa's campaign illustrates the degeneration of our public life. Really, if a political party is having a national conference to decide its future and its leadership, this is not the same thing as having a Trump campaign, which is raising money from the private sector in order to elect somebody. You know, it bothers me a great deal. Um, uh, Professor Turok, you spoke about the fact that we are looking very much at how the state was captured under Zuma, how the institutions were hollowed out, but you also spoke about the fact that the crisis that the country actually faced is the economic exclusion of the majority of people, and that the ANC has still not sat down and looked at policy options um, to address the needs of those people who are locked out of the economy, the unemployed. Take us through why you believe the African National Congress is so unable to provide the economic clarity that it requires. Well, we need to go back to apartheid. It was a system, basically a colonial type system, where a minority ruled by force, by coercion. And in the process of doing that, it created all kinds of privileges and a good lifestyle for that white minority. That was the system. When we took power in 1994, we were faced with a very serious contradiction in our public life. Namely, that the ANC won political power, but no economic power. And it was unable to shift, or it, it, this, it, it was unable to shift that economic formula to a new formula. And indeed, today we still have that formula, where a white minority 
is, is still very wealthy and powerful and occupies privilege, and the black majority are left out in the cold with the exception of a small, if you like, a black aristocracy which has been co-opted into the white uh, uh, control. Now, of and course, Professor Tirok, this was very much the argument made by those who were linked to Nkosa Zanad Lamini Zuma, talking about radical economic transformation. But we know, of course, that that was rhetoric for state capture, but it would um, uh, hopefully land with uh, people who are completely disillusioned with the system. We see the EFF doing the exact same thing. Why is it that the African National, National Congress is so bereft of of ideas and of solutions if one considers the way in which policy used to evolve. And here I'd like you to also critique the South African Communist Party and uh, the Congress of South African Trade Unions because, of course, this alliance is uh, historically um, the engine room for ideas, the engine room for change in the organization. Well, what has happened, it seems to me, that in 20 years of power, that the theoretical capacity of the movement as a whole has declined. Somehow people have become lazy and become very uh, corrupted by day-to-day -day events, by positions, by incumbency, and so on. Whereas in the years gone by, when we were in the struggle, the Communist Party was the fountainhead of theory. It was well known as the theoretical agency within the movement as a whole because it was based on a very clear historical understanding of how class forces move. And that has been gone. The Communist Party has itself jettisoned that kind of analysis. And of course, the ANC has succumbed to incumbency. And so it is up to the rest of us to really do the theoretical work to analyze. And this is not to be confused with opportunism of the Zuma type. Frankly, Zuma's radical economic transformation is a lot of rhetoric. It's not serious. He had 10 years in which to introduce radical economic transformation. And what did he do? He introduced corruption of the highest order. You know, you make a comparison with Brazil and South Africa. There was Lula, head of the Workers' Party, who is now in jail. And we have Zuma who was head of the ANC, waiting to go to jail. The parallels are clear. Mm. If, a, if a mass movement loses its capacity to have honest leadership, the, then the future is bleak. Absolutely. Now, of course, there are parties who w want to position themselves as alternatives, who have taken up the so-called radical mantle, uh, the economic freedom fighters. We have talk of a, a, workers, a socialist workers revolutionary party. Let's start with the EFF. You were in Parliament. You were there when they were there. Um, what do you make of the rhetoric of the EFF? Do we take them seriously? My personal view is that they remain a proxy for financial interests of the political elite. They are almost as if they're a faction in the African National Congress. But they do speak um, quite radically. They do posture quite radically. Are they the answer? Well, I think we must distinguish between opportunism and genuine political parties. The EFF is notable for opportunism. They latch onto anything which is popular Populism is the right phrase for the EFF. Anything which is popular, which is noisy, which is catchy, they will latch on to. And uh, nobody can take that seriously because they, they also change. There's no consistency in their policy. Today they're for this, tomorrow they're for something else. And it, I mean, the way they are dealing with King Goodwill um, Zuelatini and so on, the whole Ngonyama Trust and so on. <coughs> Sorry, honestly, you know, there's no integrity there at all. And as for Malema, we know that he's not a man of integrity. And uh, so we must distinguish between populism and the genuine development of a theoretical understanding 
of what the struggle is about. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, Kosatu itself, historically very strong uh, within organized labor, but we see the labor movement fractured. We saw the expulsion of NUMSA, the formation <laughs> of the um, you know, new federation, and out of this now, the possibility of a workers' party. Historically, when people have tried left alternatives to the African National Congress, they've done very poorly at the polls. What do you think their chances are um, and are they able to develop what you've called this minimum program that we need to put on the table to deal with exclusion, to deal with poverty, to deal with inequality? My fear about the Workers' Party is that they are what I would call ultra-left. You know, they call themselves a Marxist-Leninist party. Well, Marxism-Leninism had a, a very strong influence on history throughout the world for quite a long time. But in a way, Marxism-Leninism has faded, and it is quite extraordinary that a workers' party in South Africa should now hark back to an ideology which really has been abandoned internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is a difference between Marxism as a theory and as an analysis of a society, and Marxism-Leninism as a political program. Okay. Now, in terms of your solution, you spoke with me last week and said what we require is an economic codesa. We need to sit down again and in a real way renegotiate what um, economic policy is going to take South Africa to greater equality. Can you expand on that for me? We've got under a minute to wrap up, Professor. Yes. Well, the reality of today is that the ANC and its state is much too weak to implement really major economic programs. And therefore, they have to come to terms with business, which has the capacity to deliver on the economy. And this has to become a kind of historic compromise where the two sides meet and discuss and include labor and work out a formula which is acceptable to both. It needn't be a long-term arrangement, but it seems to me that for at least three to five years, we need a, an understanding between the government, between labor and business on how to work together to build the economy. That is essential, and I think there's no other way. Absolutely. Thank you so very much, Professor Ben Chirok, ANC stalwart, speaking to us, of course, on what he thinks ails the ruling party. Still ahead on The Fix, my expert panel and I examine whether a cabinet reshuffle is going to help the president to clean up the state.